Well, it's lovely to see so many friendly faces. Um, a little bit nerve-wracking as well. Some of you have heard me speak before. I hope it's not too much of a repeat. Um, and some of you haven't, so I hope you enjoy. Um, I'm going to talk about can you teach an old dog new tricks? And one of my esteemed colleagues in the audience has brought me a little dog whistle to keep hold of you if you'll go off too, too badly. But uh, the whole point about this talk, I hope, is to enthuse those of you that are not already enthused about the value of being active when you're older, and in particular, the value of strength, balance, and power. So hopefully at the end of it, you'll, you'll really feel that you've uh, done some strengthening work, because I'm afraid I'm not going to let you sit there for an hour and a half. You will be up doing a few things. It's quite warm. I'm hoping the uh, air conditioning will kick in in a minute. So a little bit of <laughs> what we're here about tonight. <laughs> the value of active aging is the main aim of the session, um, and in particular, strength and balance training to reduce falls. But as, uh, as Jim alluded, I wanted to have a little indulgent foray through the who, why, what, and where, and how I got where I am today, I guess with plenty of it's never too late to teach some of those old dogs some new tricks. When I first started my PhD with Professor Archie Young and Carolyn Gregg at the Royal Free, at that point, the Queen had just stopped signing telegraphs to, telegrams sorry, to people who'd reached 100. Because by that point, there were about 2,500 a year, and obviously she was getting writer's cramp. But do you know what? It's gone up like you wouldn't believe the number of older adults reaching 100 has gone up exponentially, as you can see in the graph on the far side. A girl born today has a one in three chance of reaching 100, and a boy a one in five chance. Well beyond what started 25 years ago when I started doing some of this research, when actually few people made it. It was, you know, it was a good thing to reach 100. It still is a good thing to reach 100. The issue is, what we don't want is to reach 100 sitting in a nursing home staring at four walls. And that's why the European Commission and others uh, have spent many years attempting to get lots of research to engage older adults in a variety of preventative measures so that they compress the amount of time they're sat at home staring at four walls because they can't get out and about. So this is a journey, a 23 to 25 year journey um, of exercise, physical activity, and healthy aging. <coughs> One of my favorite quotes, I've been using this for years. George Bernard Shaw says, man does not cease to play because he grows old. He grows old because he ceases to play. And so I hope, again, at the end of this, you'll go away knowing that it doesn't matter what your age, if you practice what's becoming difficult, you'll get better at it. So if you want to learn a new trick, practice, and you will. The whole point here is it is never too late. And I hope, as I say, at the end of this, you will fully agree. How many of you are under the age of 30? Have we got anyone under the age of 30 in the room? Yes, way. <laughs> Congratulations, you haven't started aging yet. Everybody else in the room is on the journey with us. Aging starts at about 25 to 30 in all forms of performance, whether it's be muscle strength, balance, our bone density, our flexibility. You can allay some of these issues. You get elite athletes at the age of 90 still competing. So it is possible to stop or slow aging. But even that 90-year-old will never be as good as he was when he was 30. So aging will come and get us. But it's that bright red sentence across the bottom that's becoming more and more important to all of us. Sedentary behavior accelerates that loss. It makes aging hit you earlier, and the effects of aging hit you earlier. <coughs> so I'm actually starting with my take-home messages, because I'm going to keep coming back to these throughout the lecture. I want to debunk some myths. It's not, it's not good to take it easy as you get older. It will just, aging will just come and hit you harder. <coughs> it's not good if your GP says, or anyone else, what do you expect at your age? We should expect the same as we're 40, 30. You can't teach old dogs new tricks. I'll show you, I hope you can. It is never too late, practice makes perfect. And I hope at the end you'll go away even if you're not involved with working with older adults, and make sure your strength and balance is as good as it possibly can be so that you have a good active aging ahead of you. 
have to embarrass my parents at the moment. <laughs> I'm an only child, and most of my childhood, I lived in London, you can tell that from my accent, most of my childhood holidays were spent up in Scotland, in Rannoch, trudging the hills. We, didn't, we weren't Monroe baggers, we just trudged the same hills every year, but it was good fun. <laughs> and down the bottom are my grandparents. I was really lucky, I had my grandparents with me till a very late age. I was actually 29 when my grandmother, my, my last grandmother, uh, passed away. You can see me over there on, the, on this side with my mother's parents. My grandfather, born in Barhead, or Barhead, sorry, um, who lived to uh, 77, which is a pretty ripe old age for, <laughs> uh, for a Glaswegian. My grandmother, born in Cathcart, lived to 96. On the far side, my father's parents, and me, again. <laughs> um, my uh, father's father, born in Mary Hill, lived to 87. And my grandmother, Bolton, but never mind, was born in, <laughs> was born in um, sorry, lived to 96. So I come from a, a family of long living uh, older adults, which is great. And on the whole, they stayed really active until the last, literally, the last few months of their life. In fact, Grandad, uh, Grandad Skelton was, had just gone off to America to see his uh, sister, who he hadn't seen for 50 years. Uh, so that was the literally weeks before he, he died. So still off and about, still very active. And that was a very important thing, I think, for me to grow up with. Because I didn't perceive old age as sitting down doing nothing. I perceived old age as my grand, age 96, going to see the old people in the nursing home. Um, and so to me, uh, ageing or, or moving around actively was certainly a big thing. The only difference was one of my grandparents, my, my father's mother, who was blind for most of her adult life. And as uh, colleagues in the room who work with visibility will know, she avoided activity because she spent her whole time being paranoid she was going to fall over. And again, falling in my grandparents became an issue which I became very interested in later on. I suppose what they showed me was that Frailty will only come and get you if you let it. <laughs> so they all had diseases, plenty of heart disease, plenty of other things going on. They were all older adults. They all lived to a ripe old age. But very few of them, or well, three of them anyway, were not going to give in and have some disuse going on as well. So it meant they coped quite well with their symptoms. They still got on with life. They had a, an attitude of, you know, I'll overcome this, whatever, whatever happens. And this disuse issue was, although uh, not sort of big in my brain at that point, was something when I first um, went to university and met uh, Olga Rutherford, who's in the audience. Um, and it was Olga who, in my first degree, got me involved with, um, well, essentially with ensuring that I had an interest in, in research. It was going along, getting my parents involved as well, having bone density measurements, um, along with David Jones, we were looking at muscle strength and fatigue as well. So as an undergraduate, that was my first inkling that research could be fun. It was quite nice to find out about things that other people didn't know about. Um, I had some inspirational uh, support, actually, as I was um, starting off in my career. Uh, People who are very well known even today in, in not just this field, but in geriatric medicine, in uh, the evidence-based care of older adults. So up the top left is myself with uh, Olga many years ago. <laughs> not the most flattering picture <laughs> for either of us, uh, but still. Uh, at this point, I had just got the fellowship that Jim mentioned with Research into Ageing. And Research into Ageing at that point were very new. Um, people didn't fund old age. They funded cancer. They funded children, um, and there was uh, the inklings of uh, the National Osteoporosis Society doing some funding at that point. And it was really Archie and uh, Carolyn who had put in a PhD studentship at that point um, because their interest was very much around what we could do with older adults' muscle and power to improve function, to make them able, if you like, to get over a threshold of disability and be able to regain some power. Along the bottom are three other people who over the years have uh, influenced certainly my thinking and influenced the uh, whole, uh, I suppose, the whole of the UK and world thinking on working with older adults, prevention of falls, and assuming that uh, 
they are, they're all in the room, so assuming that they're all okay, I'm going to mention them throughout the course of my lecture because it's not just us, many people work in this area. But there's a very important part about all of the people on this slide is that they put stuff into practice. Because otherwise it just sits on a shelf, gathering dust. Nobody ever does anything with it. Um, and I hope that over the uh, course of this uh, lecture you'll see why we do what we do. So I'm going to start off with uh, a quote which was published in 97, but I'd heard Archie say it many times, and which really influenced my way of thinking. So just like the Olympic athlete, the elderly person, I'm surprised you left the word elderly in there, <laughs> the elderly person must perform frequently and consistently at the very limit of their physical activity. The 85-year-old can therefore benefit from the study of athletic training methods. Now that probably would have frightened most people off. <laughs> what, you're going to make me exercise? But it was very interesting at that point because Archie, being a geriatrician, was influencing clinical practice and rehabilitation at this point as well. So he introduced the world to thresholds. A threshold is a point at which your performance, say strength or balance or power, drops below that that you need to do an everyday task. An example of that would be getting out of a low chair. And you'll notice that horrible bright yellow box in the corner. And each time you see that from now on, you're probably going to groan. <laughs> but let me introduce this, this um, quite, probably quite difficult graphic. Over here, you're age 20. Over here, you're aged 80. When you're 20, you've got a lot of strength. MVC is maximal voluntary contraction. Once you're 80, you've generally lost approximately half your strength. But it still takes the same strength to get out of the chair. You still need the same muscles to lift your body weight out of that low chair. So you are actually going to be, if you're unlucky, have not quite enough strength to get out without actually using your arms. And this is where, because it's the strength of the legs. So let's have a go. Do be aware that these chairs flip up again, <laughs> please. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're all... You all did that with great ease, so you obviously all have good strength at the minute. As you sit down, could you just make sure your fingers take the chair with you? Um, so sit down again, but you're going to get up again in a minute. I'll tell you when. Okay, Jim will have trouble because he's not got anything in front of him. But in a minute... <laughs> so you just got out without thinking. You all just stood up because you've got good strength, which is fantastic. Now I'm going to make you an 80-year-old. So I'm going to ask you to get out of that chair just using one leg. Now, don't do it just yet. Please hold on because it's a balance test. I don't want it to be a balance test. But I want you to feel how much work your quadricep, your thigh muscle, has to do to raise you out of that chair. So just concentrate on what your leg's doing and stand, <laughs> and stand up nice and slowly and feel that muscle working. <laughs> Right, make sure you bring the chair with you as you sit down again. <coughs> a bit of a noisy way of doing that, sorry about that. But did you feel how much work your, your muscle had to do? Suddenly you knew you had a muscle and you were having to use it. That's what an 80-year-old has to do every day. There are 80-year-olds that won't feel it at all. There are 60-year-olds that will. But the point is, someone who is reaching that threshold where suddenly they've got to still get out of that chair but do you know what? It's hard work. And this is an important thing about thresholds. The important thing is can we get <coughs> people back over them again once they've crossed them. So back in 1990-ish, uh, believe it or not, there were not normal values of strength and power for older people. There were a number of studies that had been done, quite small, um, you know, 10, 15 people. But we didn't actually have a data set where we didn't have health being an issue. And boy, was it hard to find those 200 people, age 65 up to 100, who were not taking any medications, did not have any diagnosed disease, <laughs> but we found them. Um, and we built uh, a database, which uh, Carolyn looked after for many years and had hundreds of older adults willing to take part in research on there, and we've built one now at uh, GCU as well. Two things that you'll see on that graph, which I'm afraid is, is just goes back to the days when you practically use Letraset to make your graphs, <laughs> quite a long time ago. Strength we lose at about 1.5% per year. So over a decade, 
you'll lose up to 15, 10 to 15% of your strength. Power is the speed with which we use our muscles. And we lose that about 3% a decade, sorry, a year, 30% a decade. Doesn't mean you'll get to zero, it's 30% of what you had the decade before. But it was interesting at this point, because if you think about, for example, preventing a trip, you have to get a leg out quickly or a hand out quickly. So it's the power that's important, not just the strength. Okay, so power. And this is back to all full extra set, sorry. <laughs> this is very interesting, because at this point, Again, really uh, novelly at this point, Carolyn had introduced um, some very simple functional tests. So this particular one was stepping different heights. Now this is before the days where we had nice low step buses. So to get on a bus or on a train, you had to step up quite a, quite a step. And on this graph, you'll see the percentage of people that can manage the step. This is power along the bottom. Don't pay too much attention to that. And each of these are the different step heights. But the important thing was that if you had a power over about one and a half watts per kilogram, because power is measured in light bulb watts, then you had no problem stepping. So it came out as quite an important threshold. At that point, the Allied Dunbar National Fitness Survey had started, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that had also come up with a similar threshold of amount of power that you needed. And another colleague working with Archie at that point, a clinician called David Levy, was also looking at power, but he was looking in people who'd had a hip fracture. And what he found, and again, I'll just pull you to one part of this graph, which is here. This is the power per kilogram in hip fracture patients. It's 0.4. So if you remember back to the threshold of power necessary to step, it was 1.5. So they've got a third of the power needed to step a small 30 centimetre step, whereas your healthy men and women were around about 1.3, 1.7. Obviously, we're not measuring the hip that's just fractured. It was the other side. But the point here is it was really early on to realise that hip fracture patients were really deconditioned, <coughs> and that's probably why they had the hip fracture. So they weren't able to correct that trip. Sorry, Archie, I had to put another joke one of you in. <laughs> At that point, we also were working with a student called Hazel Aston, and we were quite interested in cold muscles and the effect that that would have. And so, yes, I did stick Archie and a variety of other people into baths of cold water with ice to get their quadriceps, or their thigh muscle, down by about one degree, which is the sort of muscle temperature you get in an older person living in a cold house. And, of course, we're approaching winter, they're not putting their heating on, they will lose core temperature, they will lose muscle strength. In fact, even in healthy younger people, we were seeing a drop of a quarter of their leg power just by dropping quadricep temperature by one degree. And we'll come back to falls a bit later on. There are far more falls in winter, and it's in people's own homes. It's not slipping out on the ice. So we do still have this issue that if we don't keep warm we more likely to trip because the muscles won't work as well as they should. So to have life in years, I hope already I've got some of the things through. We need strength, but we also need balance because balance is what keeps us confident in moving about and, more importantly, it's what keeps us upright when we trip. But at this point, there wasn't many people that had done any strength work with older adults. There were one or two studies, again, fairly small. One particular one stands out where um, a lady called Maria Fiatroni had done some work with 90-year-old nursing, nursing home residents doing high-intensity strength training with them. They were still here. They hadn't died, which was uh, novel because everybody's like, oh, we don't normally do high-intensity strength training with frail people. So the whole point here is that attitudes were changing, stigmas were changing. Suddenly people were going, do you know what? Maybe we can push. Maybe we can try and do something. And Archie, again, was definitely at the leading front of that. You know, cruel to be kind, get the whip out, do some exercise, it'll do you some good. And at that point, um, Carolyn suggested I went and met Susie Dynan, uh, who... A variety of things were useful here, and I'll come back to this rather complicated graph in a minute. She taught me, first of all, how to deliver strength and balance training to frailer older adults, which was unusual in those days, to say the least. 
She'd also spent a long time looking at uh, different ways to engage older adults in strength work because many older people didn't want to go to a gym and that, at that point, was the only way you could do really good strength training. And she'd come across these TheraBands, it was all very new, which are big elastic resistance bands. We see them all the time now, but they weren't around that much then. And so she and I developed a, a training program, strength training program, 12 weeks, three times a week. They came in once a week to do a class with me and twice a week at home. And 75 plus these ladies were. And we got the same improvements in strength as a 30-year-old, the same relative improvements as a 30-year-old doing strength training. We rejuvenated 20 years' worth of lost strength in just 12 weeks. But the physios in the room, because I know I can see some of you, might be shocked to know that I went through seven resistances of TheraBands in those 12 weeks. High-intensity strength training. <laughs> so it, and it made a huge difference. And interestingly, having them in a group, when one got progressed to a different colour, everybody else wanted to be on that colour too. <laughs> and I just thought that was great, so I encouraged a bit of competition. Um, but we, you know, I had ladies measuring their biceps going... <laughs> um, it was just great fun. But what was really interesting is that we were doing some flexibility work, some warm-up and some strength work. They got so stiff. Because we were just concentrating so much on strength. And we also decided we'd do it all seated, so it was nice and... It wasn't gentle, but it was seated. Um, when I then went to measure things like, can they get up off the floor more easily? Can they get out the bath? Can they use the stairs? Nope. They were Arnold Schwarzenegger, but they couldn't do anything any better. <laughs> and I think this is really important, because this is probably one of the first times that we appreciated you had to tailor your exercise to suit what you wanted to improve. Improving strength alone wasn't going to do it. So the next one was uh, 20 women, again over 74, only eight weeks this time. Um, twice, uh, twice a week, sorry, three times a week, um, once a week at a class, twice a week at home. But we also did lots of functional exercise. And what I mean by that is lots of sit to stands, for example, lots of getting to the floor and doing some exercise on the floor, getting back up. Those were the days when health and safety wasn't like it is today. Quite a few times I couldn't get people back up off the floor <laughs> and sat there for quite a while with them <laughs> um, until I had the strength to lift them up. <laughs> but the point is that at the end of this, we got similar improvements in strength, but suddenly they were in and out the bath again, they were cutting their own toenails, they were, you know, all these other functional things. So, you know, at this point, really, it was important to know that it wasn't just strength, but it was doing repetitive movements that you wanted to improve, being specific. And this is also the first time I ever wrote a book which was a little booklet called Exercise for Healthy Aging. It was all the exercises in this particular research trial. Um, and it was distributed uh, through Research into Aging for a donation. They are you know, bestseller, 150,000 of them they got rid of in that period. I still get emails from people now saying, does it exist? Believe it or not, it's on eBay for £40 at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I should do that. <laughs> But it's, it was fascinating because these didn't exist either. You didn't, you didn't have booklets of exercise for older people. You didn't have videos. You have to remember that back then it was not normal for older people to exercise. Whereas now it's quite normal. Well, hopefully. Uh, there's me having got a group on the floor. Yep, that was fun. I can remember distinctly getting them back up again after that. <laughs> I also learned you did check that they could get up off the floor again before you got them down in the first place, <laughs> but still. Um, but this never too late message is really quite important. And again, Susie's done some great work over the years with a variety of colleagues, with stroke survivors, with vulnerable older people through GP practice, and even... Um, and I'm sure many of you will remember Katie Malbert uh, doing high-intensity aerobic work. They didn't like that, because <laughs> um, obviously you have to be breathless for a lot of it. They weren't too keen. But really good improvements in aerobic capacity and stamina. So it is never too late. But care and uh, effectiveness are important. Um, the important thing here is, at this, point, at this point also, there weren't standards of training. So anybody could pick up my booklet, for example, and go and run a class with it. They didn't have to have any qualifications, didn't have to really uh, be careful. Um, and Susie and others and Archie were involved in a variety of documents over those years which embedded uh, good quality assurance mechanisms, 
good training uh, programs to ensure that we actually had some safe exercise out there for the frailest. I'm not talking about your general older adult, but for somebody who, for example, had a stroke or someone who uh, was a regular faller. So falls at this point was coming into my head quite a bit, and this is mostly because my gran had started tripping over daily. Um, she was able to get up again for a long time, actually, many, many years, but she just kept hitting the floor. Um, and, of course, I was hearing about her friends who'd had falls but broken hips and ended up in nursing homes, and falls just seemed to be surrounding at that point. And I started working with a group to come up with uh, a simple risk assessment tool, um, which is still quite well used today. Those five questions at the bottom are the questions that the GP or the practice nurse would ask. And if they had three or more of those, they should essentially have a more in-depth falls risk assessment with a falls service. But of course, back then, falls services didn't exist. So that just meant go back to the GP who might um, look at their fingernails a bit and go, be careful then. <laughs> so we didn't have services to support fallers uh, back in those, in those days. Things have uh, improved a lot. And the Health Education Authority had started um, alerting people, I think, to the fact that fractures were going to go up because the older population was living longer. But more importantly, fractures appeared to be going up over and above the more older adults. And this is quite important because this was suggesting a couple of things. It was suggesting, number one, our bones are getting weaker, that we're fracturing earlier, perhaps. Or are we you know, becoming less and less fit so we can't correct that trip? hitting the floor earlier, you know, all sorts of potential reasons, but hip fractures were starting to appear on the radar as a costly event. Just to give you some up-to-date figures on the costly event, this is literally hot off the press. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> um, these are some figures about falls just in Scotland. So a cost of a single fall is about one and a half, just over one and a half thousand. Uh, once we get to hip fractures, we're talking 22,000, sorry, sorry, 40,000. Um, if you look at falls and fractures, it's going to cost Scotland about £470 million a year, um, and 45% of those go into long-term care costs because the outcomes of hip fractures are generally quite poor. This is why falls are important. This is just one country. It's happening all over the world. And it's that little yellow box appeared, so you know what's coming. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about falls and balance. And balance requires a variety of things. It requires good strength, actually. That's the most important thing. It requires good strength around the ankles, which you'll feel in a minute. But it also requires a number of inputs into the brain to keep us upright. It requires good vision. Although if people are blind, actually their vision is usually... Sorry, their, their balance is quite good because they listen to all the other senses. But if you are sighted, it's an important part of your balance. Vestibular, that's your inner ear balance. Anyone who's ever had a really bad cold quite often gets dizzy because they've caused problems with the inner ear. And proprioceptive information, uh, essentially feedback from the joints of our uh, bones and our muscles that give information back to the brain about where we are in space. All of these go down with age, particularly vision, uh, and all of these mean that we sway more, basically. So I'm going to get you to stand up again. So the first thing I'd like you to do, Jim, again, you're at risk. <laughs> I'd like you to take the weight onto one leg, I don't mind which one, and just take the other foot off the floor. If you feel you need a hand in front of you onto there, that's fine. I practice this a lot, which is why I'm quite stable. Can you feel how much work your ankle's doing to keep you upright for a start? That's why ankle strength's so important when we're older. Okay. <laughs> Put your foot down, just get your step back again. Let's try the other foot, because you'd have picked your best one. You always do. So, other foot. Now, I would like to show you the effect of vision. Please be careful. You will sway a lot. Close your eyes for me. Very good. Right. You can sit down. I'm not going to... Uh... <laughs> I wouldn't dream of challenging the other two. I'd have some falls. But the point again here is if you remember childhood, children in a playground, they spend the whole time on one leg, they walk backwards, they absolutely no problem with balance. And we all have had, at one point in our lives, good balance. 
And then we spend the rest of our lives avoiding doing anything to challenge it. Uh, and so it's important that we think about that, and you'll see that a little bit later. So when do we become fallers? Actually, I'm just going to do a quick poll in the room. How many of you in this room have fallen in the last year? Just look round. It's at least a third, yeah? Which is the same as older adults. Older adults, about a third of older adults will fall every year. The big difference is older adults may not be able to get up again, may have more injuries, more likely to fracture, and certainly more likely to develop fear. At some point, though, the simplest of things will trip us over. So it might be walking across their kitchen floor. Perfectly normal kitchen floor, it's always been like it is. But suddenly that day, they don't lift their foot up quite enough and they hit the floor. So there is a point at which our balance and strength deteriorates to such an extent that we can't easily correct a trip. Fracture sites also change with age, interestingly. And this is, I think, very much, again, related to physical activity and exercise. So when you are young, younger, 40, 50, 60, and you fall, you have time to do something, and the hand goes out. You try and stop yourself. So you're far more likely to have a wrist fracture or an arm fracture. You go to the other end of the spectrum, the 80s, 90-year-olds, they're like Charlie Chaplin. Just go. Nothing, nothing's to, nothing tries to stop them. And a lot of that isn't cognitive function. It's reaction time, coordination. These are components of fitness. So, again, if they avoid activity, they're more likely to have that sort of nasty fracture. Working with uh, Olga at uh, Queen Mary's, with one of the BSC, uh, one of the medical students, actually, at this point, we started being quite interested. We, we, it was almost by accident that we noticed that people's legs were different. So, one, of the, you know, one would be quite a bit stronger than the other. And this wasn't past strokes or anything along those lines. This was... Literally, people who said, oh, well, you know, I had a fall and I hurt my knee. And essentially, they were not using the side that hurt. So they were detraining the side that had an injury and working on the other. Just want to pull your attention to a couple of things here. Power. These are non-fallers. Sorry, these are fallers. So they've got up to 15% difference between legs, whereas the non-fallers, it's about 5%. So fallers seem to be showing big asymmetry, particularly in the lower limb power, quadricep strength, and in ankle strength. So, exercise should work then. Any exercise should work. If it just requires good strength and balance, anything that does work with your strength and balance should make all the difference, we hope. Under this point, I sat down with Susie and we had been introduced to some seminal work, which many of you in the Falls world will have heard of, by John Campbell and Claire Robertson, the Otago Home Exercise Programme. And this was a programme that was a year long, strength and balance exercises for people to do at home with support, and it had reduced falls. But of course, you always want to do it better than somebody else. So Susie and I set out to develop a programme where we'd progress the strength work far more than they had in Otago. We'd progress the balance work. At this point, my gran was falling regularly and had stopped being able to get up off the floor. So she would lie there for many hours until we got home from work or whatever. So we just thought, great, let's put some floor skills in so we can regain that, uh, that lost component of fitness. And what was really interesting at this point is the Otago program doesn't have anything on aerobic capacity or stamina. Um, it doesn't do any much work on flexibility. So the whole point here was to try and get in some of those key components of fitness that were missing from some of those programs. Because I was working closely with Olga Rutherford, I was also really interested in bone. For me, it was important to prevent fractures as well. Now, we would never have enough people in this study to show we could prevent fractures, but we wanted the exercise intensity to be such that we would potentially improve bone mineral density. And so, at this point, my focus had also gone on to bone. But, of course, if you're working with fallers, you are reaching people who are frightened, fearful, often have osteoporosis and weak bones, and a plethora of other diseases go on alongside that. So, again, tailoring your exercise program so that they could do this comfortably, safely, but still progressively was important. So here's some of our fame ladies. 
at the beginning of the program, they all had to have transport into the uh, gyms. They were all running gymnasiums. So we had to provide taxis for all of them because they didn't use public transport. They were frightened of travelling. They'd all had three or more falls in the past year. The oldest lady was actually 98. And they took part in a nine-month programme, once a week in an exercise class with us and twice a week at home. This was not the first week. <laughs> but if you work with someone for nine months, you can do an amazing amount of work with them. So we even got to obstacle courses. We got to putting um, obstacles under big mats so they couldn't see them, but they had to cope with them. You know, built, built things up over time. This lady went out and bought her special leotard for the first day we were going to do the floor work. Um, but what was really interesting is they built a lovely cohesive group, which they named themselves the Fallen Angels. Uh, and I still get letters, emails, um, and Facebook uh, friend requests from them. <laughs> so many of them are still about, which, if you, you know, this, we're talking now nearly 20 years ago, this study. They were 65 plus then, and they were frequent fallers. Frequent fallers at this point, according to Stephen Lord and others, if someone had had three or more falls the previous year, about half of them would be dead in a nursing home or living uh, well, in hospital, basically, uh, the following year. So outcomes for frequent fallers are really quite poor. So we got some uh, floor work in. Main aim there, of course, was to save the dignity of having, or the indignity of having an ambulance crew come and pick you up, dust you off, and put you back in your chair, which about 40% of fallers have. But more importantly, we reduced falls. We reduced, basically, falls risk by about a half. So these frequent fallers were still occasionally falling, but they were bouncing back up again. That was the important thing. They were, they'd stopped reducing activity. They were getting out and about. And we followed up um, at the end the control group and the exercise group. And a third of the, ex of the control group were dead in a nursing home or in hospital. So, you know, ethically, looking back, <laughs> it wasn't fair not to put them in an exercise program. But we didn't know we were going to have quite such, a, quite such an effect. Really good improvements. I'm going to run through some of these quite fast, actually. But good improvements in strength and power. Um, in each, each of these, it's your uh, darker group, which are the exercise, and the pink group, which are the control group. Good improvements in balance. Uh, reductions in asymmetry. First time that an exercise program had been shown to, uh, I wouldn't say improve bone, to stop the loss of bone. Because the control group were losing bone still. The exercise group had maintained it. So, again, nice um, first time and, and still the only time an exercise program for falls has shown that. But what did they like? They liked the fact that they started to use buses again. They, this is them all making their way over to my house for a party. Um, playing, with the playing on the floor with their grandchildren, going to the beach, cutting their own toenails, um, all those sorts of things. And one lady even got to the point where she uh, contacted me because uh, she started to play tennis again. Um, and she wanted a set of hip protectors. So that she could feel comfortable doing it. Um, so, you know, really good outcomes. But there are people living in nursing homes, for example, that are not going to go and join a group. Um, and so sometimes we have to look differently. This is some work uh, I did a while back, looking essentially at a motorised wobble board. Um, so she was hanging on for dear life uh, at the beginning of it. Um, and most of them could only stand for about five minutes on it to start with. And that was, to, that was enough. They had to sit down. But by the end of four weeks, they were all standing on it for 20 minutes at a time. So we're back again to we should stop wrapping people up in cotton wool. Their improvements will be great if you encourage and, and get them to understand the reason for the intensity of the work. There's been so many studies now working with these frailer, older adults, showing really good improvements. And yet, still, when you go to a care home and you talk about instigating an exercise program, you get this look of total disbelief. Why would you want to do that? And I just don't understand why, you know, we're 20, 30 years down the line and we still can't engage care homes with doing proper exercise rather than gentle, seated exercise. I mean, this study is a nice, simple one. You tried it just now. You stood there on one leg. Uh, not, it's not very long, admittedly. But this study was looking for six months, single leg stand for one minute at a time, three times a day. So every time you put your kettle on, stand there on one leg. And if you're over 70, you get improvement in hip bone mineral density. So we're not necessarily talking something that's really hard work to improve some of these outcomes that we want to see. 
So we had at this point quite a number of initiatives coming through uh, the UK about reducing falls, but if you went to most uh, physio-led programs, for example, they weren't delivering strength and balance training. So that's the point at which uh, essentially I went slightly part-time academically and joined up with the three musketeers. That's myself, Susie Dynan and Bob LaVincia. And we're not looking after the, the King of France. What we're trying to do is look after evidence-based training for older adults. So this is a not-for-profit company that we're involved with. And all across the top are the evidence-based. So they're all based on published research um, to try and get uh, evidence-based training into the fitness industry and into health professions. So at this point, uh, I met Professor Chris Todd at the University of Manchester. And I can't remember where, it was over in Utrecht or somewhere interesting like that, at um, a conference. And I'd been talking about exercise and falls, and Chris had been talking about this new project he wanted to get up and going. And so he tempted me out of London to go work in Manchester for a <coughs> while. And we worked on Profane, Prevention of Falls Network Europe. Profane was an amazing project. Um, I can't remember exactly now, I think it was 17 partners, or something like that, 20 partners um, across Europe. And the whole point here was to tighten up the research, because there have been lots of studies on falls, but they all use different outcomes, so you couldn't put them together to have a look at the effect. So there was consensus on outcome measures, there was taxonomy or understanding of the different components of different interventions, developments of fear of, fa uh, fear of falling scales with Chris and others. So it was a really, really good project, which of course eventually stopped being funded um, and from out of that, of the ashes if you like, came profane.co which some of you I know are, are aware of. But again back to this fear issue. Chris was a psychologist and had sort of really picked up on the emerging uh, small at that point literature on fear of falling um, and particularly avoidance of activity. And I remember my gran again, didn't have any fear until the point at which she couldn't get up off the floor without somebody picking her up. And then all of a sudden, a switch turned. It's different for different people. But you see here a quote down the bottom. It's the fear that restricts me. In my mind, I know I can't. The fear of falling and not having the strength to go out stops me from going out. It's a restriction, social isolation, the depression that starts out of that is, is really quite awful. And sometimes, for some people, it's not at all relevant. They don't actually have high risk of falls, but they develop the fear anyway. So up to 50% of older adults, with or without a fall's history, will, uh, will admit to concern or fear about falling. I've been involved in a study which will come out next year now, a Cochrane Review, where we've done a meta-analysis of all the studies out there on exercise which have had fear of falling as an outcome measure. And a fair number now, actually. Um, if you go back seven, eight years, there was hardly any, but there's been a lot of interest in it. And what's really interesting is that prescribed exercise, strength and balance exercise in particular, does seem to reduce fear really well, actually, but only while they're still doing it. And if you follow up afterwards, only a few weeks even, they've, they've regained the fear. So while people are exercising, they get more confident, they get much more uh, able or willing to try things out. And at the moment, these follow-up studies also haven't seen any particular effect on habitual physical activity, so how much they get out and about. So we've still got a lot to learn on what sort of exercise is, is best to reduce that long-term. However, I hope at the end of this, you might realise that actually it's better just to carry on exercising anyway. <laughs> because everything you look at you will detrain as soon as you stop, whether it be fear or muscle strength. This is quite a complicated slide, but this is a, an interesting, another meta-analysis by Sherrington et al. over in uh, Australia. And they've looked at the hundreds now of studies looking at exercise and falls. And overall, if you just stick all of that data into one big pot, you get a 17% reduction in falls. So these are studies with approaching 10,000 fallers in them. Big studies. So you might just say, well, okay, any exercise works then. But for those of you that know forest plots, anything that goes that side of that line, like that one, you really wouldn't want to be in. Because what it's done is increased your risk of falls. And there's a number of them. There's a number of studies there, if you look closely, where, ooh, it might actually have made things worse. 
But first of all, what really makes the, the difference on what, what works best? Let's go for the positive. So this is an analysis that they've done within their study at three main things within an exercise program that might have made a big difference. Highly challenging balance training on their feet for at least 40% of the class. High dose. Actually, we're looking at 50 hours, 5-0. Five 5-0 zero. Five zero hours before we see a big effect on reduction of falls. And no walking program, which will alert you to what I'm just about to talk about now, which, which things increase risk. There's a wide range of abilities, particularly amongst fallers. If someone is a, has very, very poor strength and balance, and you send them out brisk walking, they'll fall over the pavements. So it's important to think about the person in front of you in terms of what exercise you offer. This is an 82-year-old who's doing a hop, skip and jump and is obviously very fit. This is an 82-year-old that's got osteoporosis and in a nursing home. We have a massive range of differences in same age groups in older adults. And it's important to remember that the way we work with them should differ. So back to our tricks and dogs. Some will need stabilizers. Some will need a stable base. And some you can progress on to truly challenging balance exercise. But it's important to get that right. So is there a time when it's really not safe to say, go off and be more active? Probably yes. If they're frail, if they require walking frames, do not send them out brisk walking <laughs> because they will just trip over. Obviously, a better safe walking route would be useful. In terms of the issue with, with falls and exercise, the whole top part of that slide is the improvements that come out of many studies showing that exercise reduces falls, improves quality of life, etc. But there's this area down here where unsafe practice, an example of that might be an older adults exercise group where they spend the whole time doing cross steps across the room. Now, someone who hasn't got good balance will fall over their own feet. So unsafe practice, for example. Tiredness, brisk walking does that. If you get tired, you don't lift your feet. Um, if you're taking yourself way out your centre of gravity, or indeed your pavements are bad. So all of those things are going to increase risk in some older adults. And some, some work with colleagues in the room, with uh, Rita Newton and Marcus Olmerod, looking at outdoor falls, has um, really shown some interesting stuff just recently. We know that falls outdoors tripping over pavements, etc., um, will lead, are more likely to lead to fractures and falls indoors. And in fact, there's a high rate of death for outdoor falls. But it's interesting because you can actually identify hotspots where these falls are happening. From Scottish ambulance data, and you wouldn't want to be in the central belt. <laughs> Part of this is to do with how many people live there, of course, but it is standardised for, for population size. But of course, there are certain places where there is more people, you're more likely to get knocked, you're more likely to not to see an object because other things are distracting you, etc. But there are definite hotspots uh, around Scotland. So we need to be thinking about how we can deal with this and whether we can deal with it. There are certain conditions, stroke being one of them, but almost also rheumatoid arthritis, which will increase your risk of <coughs> something giving, of a joint giving, your knees, your hips, your ankles. So we're aware that these people are likely to have more falls, and some work by Emma Stanmore um, and, and uh, others has shown a massive rate of falls in people with, art, with rheumatoid arthritis, irrespective of age, so, and, and also injury. So we need to be thinking about this. What about dual tasking? How many of you have trouble doing two things at once? <laughs> it's not just men. <laughs> um, there's been some early research on this uh, before, which shows that people trying to do two things at once are more likely to get distracted and fall. But some work by um, a student here, Jennifer, who's now back in Jordan, uh, doing hard work out there, was looking essentially at, could we develop a simple dual task test? I won't go into too much depth, but what's interesting is that women denote different dual tasking. They talked about household things, so they're carrying the washing up the stairs and the phone rings, or, and the men were talking about being outside and dogs running in front of them and footballs going past, so quite a gender difference in what older people consider a dual task. But a very, very simple one, which predicted falls, was literally carrying a glass of water, walking, 
and responding to questioning. So your brain has to think about the answer, you've got to get your walking right and you mustn't spill your water. Um, quite simple to do, um, but falls are never one thing. So it doesn't predict all fallers by any means, but it's quite a nice simple test to look at, at that. And it's interesting because all the studies in those red lines which have increased risk are all things which involve people being outdoors. Um, talked about the environmental risk. This study actually had to be stopped about three quarters of the way through because there were more, so many fractures, they actually had to ethically stop the study. But again, thinking about outdoors, you've got people going past, you're responding to noise, you've got dogs and things running about. All of these things are dual task. So moving really now into getting some of this into practice before I just, it's only about five minutes left. Um, this was a uh, question work by the Department of Health because one of the things they were interested in was to try and actually get a cohesive um, prevention package going across the UK in terms of falls particularly. Um, so myself and Susie uh, wrote this um, document which uh, is still, still out there which is all about the evidence, synthesizing the evidence base, if you like, about what you needed to do to prevent falls and fractures. And within that, that dose, the 50 hours, was made very clear. How many of you in the room are working in the National Health Service at the minute? And doing exercise sessions with older adults who fall? I'm not going to put you on the spot, Leslie, don't worry. <laughs> How many of you do more than 12 weeks? Not a hand. And... When you do those 12 weeks, is it once a week? So you're doing 12 hours. So we're not even a quarter of the way to an effective dose. So these are the two main ones that occur across the UK. There's the FAME programme that I spoke about just now, and the Otago that led me to do the FAME programme in the first place. Those are the two most commonly presented programmes across the UK, and in the right you'll see in blue the things which have been shown to improve with those. And yet an audit last year showed that only 30% of them actually use any form of progression in terms of strength work. Only half of them uh, were given an exercise booklet which actually bothered to progress the exercise in terms of strength or balance. 81% were offered 12 weeks or less, and 86% only meant once a week. So even though we have such a strong evidence base, it's still not happening in practice. It's vital to actually move people on. Nobody expects the NHS to deliver 50 hours. That's a lot, and it's going to cost a lot. But there needs to be an effective transition on to something else that will actually help and will reduce uh, falls. More importantly, what we don't want to do is transition someone onto a seated exercise class when you've just improved their balance. And yet that is, to me, when I talk to people, the most common place that people are sent. There are, there's a directory out there which has qualified people, and you can just put the postcode in and find a, 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 you know, a useful, a, a trained teacher that can actually do effective work with you, either on a one-to-one -one basis or in groups. And yet still, the evidence doesn't seem to get out there as much as we'd like. What about those older people down the bottom of the triangle? So at the top, you've got your hip fracture patients, very frail, and then you've got your, your regular fallers. But there's a, there's a most older adults. They're out there having fun. They're not falling all the time. They're, they, you know, they're enjoying life. But we need to keep them that way. So how do we then think about prevention? So my final part of the talk is just going to be about preventing falls in the first place. With colleagues here, Tracy Howe, um, and Fiona, who's in the audience as well. We did a synthesis of many studies, um, 94 different studies, looking at exercise to improve balance with, again, nearly 10,000 participants. And all of these forms of exercise, so, for example, Tai Chi, Scottish country dancing, that colleague Morag Thau had done some work here, um, strengthening work, uh, yoga, Pilates, any form of step aerobic or bums and tums class, anything like that, those definitely improve balance. We know that it needs to be at least three times a week for about 12 weeks. So we're back again, so you can't do it in a couple of weeks. But this is interesting because so often people say, oh, but I walk. Walking does not improve balance. It does not improve strength, and it does not improve bone density. Unless you're willing to do it 
really fast, uphill, with a load of weighted packs on your back. <laughs> and most people are not going to do that. Walking is great at getting out and about and socialising. It's not great at improving the components of fitness that we need to stay independent. So walking is good. And with colleagues uh, in, in uh, Strathclyde at that point, but now in Edinburgh, we looked at uh, a feasibility study of, of increasing physical activity through general practice with walking. There were some falls, but not a huge number, because they were screened uh, beforehand. But interestingly, although really good improvements in step count and stamina, people, with the GPs particularly, were going, well, that's great, but you know it takes too long to screen people. I'm not going to implement that. So we're back again to, even when an evidence base sits in someone's face, they don't necessarily do anything with it. Luckily, Paths for All, um, who are a, a, a government-funded um, group across Scotland that deliver walk leader training, um, had picked up on this strength and balance issue. And so we've put together a series of strength and balance exercises they can do at the end of their walks, um, and hope, or brought home in between walks to make sure that they stay as active as possible. And finally, a large study, this has taken six years to get the results from, um, very long, long-term study, uh, 1,300 older people through primary care, randomised into either a Targo or FAME, or usual care, which was go out and be more active. And the main outcome actually was, was habitual physical activity, but they had falls as a secondary outcome. So this is the first time these were not fallers, these were just older adults through general practice. And again, a bit heavy, but let me just pull you to a couple of things here. This column here is all the results for the FAME study. Here's the Otago, and here's your usual care at the end. The ones in bold are the ones that are significant. And more importantly, what really it's showing is that you see a reduction in falls as a primary prevention with FAME, but not with Otago. And again, this is probably because FAME has got all the components of fitness. You've got a lot of aerobic work in there, so they're, they're going to be less fatigued, for example. Um, and uh, uh, in the long run, unfortunately, although Otago is one of the most commonly uh, prescribed forms of exercise, it works with fallers. It doesn't appear to prevent falls in the first place. Most of the population is down there. I'd suggest probably most of the room is down there, unfortunately, uh, me included. So the whole point is, of course, that we go up towards the meeting, the guidelines. And in my little pricey of this talk, I tantalized you with the fact that I'd tell you how much exercise, the minimum amount of exercise you had to do to maintain health and independence. So I'm moving into that section, and I'm afraid it's not good news. <laughs> We're all sitting. And I'm going to bring up some work now of two colleagues, three colleagues I'm working with at the minute uh, at GCU. Juliet Harvey has just finished a, a review um, of a number of studies with three, well, over three and a half, uh, sorry, 372,000 older adults in these studies. This is self-report of sitting behaviour. Um, and as you'll see, if you count sitting for more than six hours daily, for example, it's approaching 30%. Uh, if you count sitting for uh, more than four hours, then we're up to 50 60%. How many hours do you think you sit in a day? It's frightening when you try and add it up, and particularly if we spend a lot of time in front of a computer or a TV. And the TV is an interesting one because in these, uh, Dunstan and others have done some big meta-analyses of, of health data, taking into account lots of other things, but what they've essentially shown is if someone sits for more than four hours watching television compared to sitting for less than two, they have doubled their risk of all-cause mortality. They're going to die faster, <laughs> essentially, because they watch too much telly. Um, and if you look at severe cardiovascular disease, it's an 80% increased risk. So all go home and turn your tellies off. This is interesting, though, because that was self-report. This is actual measurement. This is put a monitor on and see how long they really do sit. Um, and here you have um, about 60% of older adults sit for eight and a half hours a day double what they self-report. So it's quite interesting that people don't realise how long they sit for. You can see that little yellow box. I'm sorry, I'm going to break your sitting again in a minute. This is an interesting bit of work. It's nothing to do with me, but I think it's a fascinating bit of work. And this is looking at people who meet guidelines. So they do a lot of exercise, but they've been monitored on during their day what they're up to. 
And the person here is someone who spends long periods of time sitting, then might go up and go for a run. So they also spend long periods of time being active. This person breaks up lots of little bits of movement. Doesn't sit for very long, doesn't do exercise for very long. Probably a smoker. But <laughs> <laughs> what's interesting is of these groups, the, the group that prolong, that spend long periods of time sitting, don't forget they both meet guidelines. They're both doing enough exercise to meet guidelines. The group that sit for long periods are far more likely to get obese and get diabetes. So breaking periods of sitting is really important. And on that note, just stand up for a second because you haven't done for a little while. <laughs> and we'll go for the last, the last five minutes. Great. Just stand up for a second while you look at this lot. <laughs> this is um, some of the reasons why we sit, some of the purposes and where we sit. And Seb Shastan, who's in the room, has been doing some great work on taxonomizing sitting. Um, and an example, I'll let you sit down again now. <laughs> um, an example is why we sit. And many people sit for work, for leisure, for transport, or socially. They sit down to have something to eat, toileting, all sorts of reasons why people sit. Some are good, some are not so good. And some, they do things they probably shouldn't do, like in front of the telly with a big bag of popcorn and a can of beer. So the associated behaviours that go with some of those sedentary behaviours are important. And Seb, Philippa, Dahl and myself are involved at the moment with a big MRC grant looking at uh, how we can look at the determinants of sedentary behaviour. <coughs> so just finishing on my last a bit of annoyance with the health service, as I do on a regular basis, patients in hospital. My father spent a month in hospital this time last year. And in that month, Mum and I went in every day to visit, and every day he looked at me and went, oh, God, is she's going to move me again. Uh, and I mobilised, I tried to get him to move. But essentially, he was not encouraged to move at all much the rest of the time. When he left, I'd say he'd probably lost half his muscle strength. So we call that sarcopenia. Some of you may have come across that. What patients, what are we doing? What harm are we doing to patients? This is some work by Margaret Grant, who works here. And this was looking at older people's behaviour on wards with monitors. And you'll notice that by far all their periods where they, where they were uh, doing something for over 60 minutes were sitting, and all the periods where they were being active were less than five minutes. So they were basically getting up and going to the toilet. We, are, we know that sedentary behaviour causes so much trouble, causes so much loss of muscle, and yet we do not encourage mobilisation on the wards. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting we do that... But we know, and there's plenty of studies out there, that show that if you do exercise or you encourage people to exercise at that point, it continues a good message when they leave. So they're more likely to be active afterwards. Some of these studies are quite short, three weeks, three months uh, after leaving hospital. Really good improvements in these frailer older adults. So the problem is we're still here. 40% of the UK is still sedentary. Um, and we've known these messages, some of these messages, for years. I'm going to go past that one. This is a threshold one. This is actually from the Allied Dunbar National Fitness Survey many, many years ago. And this was showing the number of women over here whose quadriceps strength is getting really close to not being able to get out of a low chair. And these are healthy women, only at the age of 70. So if we live to 100, we've got 30 years of somebody looking after us. We definitely don't want that. We've got hundreds of policy agendas. Scotland's got more than anywhere else. So it's not that there isn't a government push for it, but we're still down there. So let's finish off with how much do you need to do. Okay. Is that That's a no. I wouldn't dream. <laughs> okay, how much do we need to do? I thought I'd leave on a, on a note, which might depress you or might not. We should be doing about 150 minutes of activity in a week that makes us slightly warmer or slightly breathless. That can be anything. It can be dancing, it can be digging, it can be cycling, it can be swimming. But it has to be done to an intensity that makes you slightly warmer or slightly out of breath, moderate physical activity. And it needs to be in balance for at least 10 minutes. You don't have to do all 150 minutes at once. In fact, I hope you learned from what I mentioned earlier, break your sitting and do 10 minutes and then sit down again. <laughs> so build it up. 150 minutes. You should be looking at something to improve your muscle strength on at least two days of the week. Sit to stands every advert break. You should be looking at something that improves your balance. 
at least twice a week, even if it's just standing next to your kettle on one leg. And you should minimise the amount of time you spend sitting. But most people don't want to do it. That's the problem. And if you're older and you're frailer and you've got all these conditions and everyone's telling you it's good to be active and you go, leave me alone. <laughs> so this is the issue we're always going to have to, to face. Motivation is a big problem. I'm actually going to just do one or two more talks, uh, sessions on some voices of older people. If we're going to encourage older people to exercise to prevent falls, they have to realise it will help. And at the moment, certainly some, some work by Chris Todd and Lucy Yardley, we know that most older adults don't think exercise will prevent falls, and they think it's for someone older and frailer than them, even if they do live in sheltered accommodation. Some people just think it's going to happen. It's fatalistic. I'm old. I will fall. Everybody falls when they're old. So you may not get them involved in there. You don't want to depress yourself. You don't want to look at that in the future. So we have these things to fight against. They might not think they can keep up with people in the group. They might not think that somebody else thinks they should do it. There's all sorts of reasons and, and why, ways at which we should try and motivate people to do exercise to prevent falls. The difficulty is it involves one-to-one -one conversations, and we're not very good at that in our public health or NHS system. The instructors make a difference. We now know of a lot of research on this. So empathetic, friendly, uh, well-qualified um, instructors, which will foster some group cohesion, make all the difference to attendance. We know that. And we know from some seminal work here by Stephen Uzo, who's in the, in the room, that developing computer games, which you can only score highly if you do the movement with good quality, will really engage. So the green line over there is how many people still did all those exercises regularly over 12 weeks. The blue line and the red line are people that got a booklet to do at home or some other form of visualisation. So we need to think out, outside the box about how we encourage people to keep doing things. Plenty of literature out there. People don't read literature. <laughs> we need to have a different spin on fitness. We need to sell it. We need to market it better. Public engagement activities are a great way of doing that. Um, lots of fun things have been uh, in, in Glasgow over the last few years to engage older adults into activity. I'm going to move past that. And just finishing off with something that's going a bit ballistic at the minute. Um, this is Glasgow Cali working with the uh, British Heart Foundation National Centre and Later Life Training, looking at functional fitness, MOTs, testing out someone's uh, ability to do Strength work, pa balance, power, etc., comparing to the norms, sitting down, having a conversation with them, and the follow up of those people who have done that is that on the whole they do increase activity quite well. So, as Jim alluded, we need to try and improve healthy, active life years. Profound, which is a new project that Chris Todd is leading at Manchester and GC are involved in, is aiming to support that. But really, I want to leave you with just three simple things. Sit less, move or walk more, and please challenge your strength and balance as often as possible. You are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. We see that all the time. This chap is 94 and started his strength training career at 67. So I hope I've left you with the it's never too late message, um, and I would welcome any questions from you. <laughs>